Hey everybody, Nick Holmes here. I am the co-owner of M3 Yoga, two studios in Athens, Georgia, as well as the founder of our teacher training program here. I lead 200 and 300 hour teacher trainings all around, and I'm here to give you some teacher tips today. Uh, today's tips are specifically focused around language and communication and how to make your language more impactful while you're teaching yoga. So buckle up and listen in. Today, we're specifically looking at the things that you say and how you can potentially improve how you say them. So as teachers, we are responsible for moving people's bodies. And often, people have new, are developing new connections with their bodies and have difficulty figuring out how to move them <laughs> the best. So uh, something I subscribe to, something I teach my teachers to teach, and something that we utilize in our feedback process here at the studios is direct command form. So I'm not going to give you a grammar lesson per se, <laughs> um, but you can look up what direct command form is and the difference. Um, but I am going to show you some of the things it's not. <laughs> when you're Teaching yoga, especially if you're a new teacher, sometimes we default into language that comes naturally to us. And it's very easy to be unaware of things that we say. I often, when I am receiving feedback from a class, am unaware of some of the go-to phrases or the go-to things that I say to people. Uh, and it's really illuminating <laughs> to hear that because we kind of fall back into what's comfortable, particularly if we're teaching something complex or something new or something that we might be uncomfortable with uh, or a different style, we're able to fall into language traps uh, that make our classes feel less impactful and really take away some of the power that you have when you're commanding a room full of people, especially a room full of bodies that usually move quite differently and have different ways of interpreting that language and different ways of moving their body based on how they're interpreting that language. So the best thing that we can do for our students is speak clearly, effectively, and with authority. And that's the part that I see people struggle with the most. Sometimes when people come to teacher training, they have never been given the authority to hold command. They have never been given permission to speak authoritatively and with uh, a lot of power. And by power, I just mean the way that you're speaking, the tonality, the inflection, all of these things matter in how your voice can be interpreted by the student. And we'll go over that in another video, but this is specifically about the words you say. So the first step is getting comfortable with being in the seat of the teacher and at command. <laughs> We, uh, first and foremost, in an asana-based class, are responsible for moving people's bodies. And the more clearly you can communicate what you want people to do, the more easily they are able to interpret that, integrate it into their bodies, and then do what you want them to do. And I'm sure we've all been in those moments where we've set a cue and we look around in the room and everybody's doing something different and you're like, okay, well, clearly that didn't work. And I usually throw out the joke, hey, you know, if it's one or two people, maybe it's your fault. But if it's more than half the people, clearly what I said was not effective. Um, and it's, it's okay. I think the second step is giving yourself the ability to make mistakes and giving yourself a little bit of grace. Because when you start teaching, you're adapting to so many different things. Environmental, for example, the rain is, is coming down and we have this beautiful warehouse space studio for um, our small studio. And, and there's all kinds of sounds that are happening that you just kind of have to adapt to, even when you're filming a video, uh, hence the microphone. But one thing I would like to uh, encourage you to do is, is be easy on yourself because we're all learning new things. And the third step is really 
begin to get clear on your queuing. I always recommend scripting out classes as an exercise. And you don't necessarily have to script out an entire class, but it does take some time. This is an exercise that our teacher trainees have to do in my 200 hour teacher training. They have to script out and literally write out an entire script for an entire class to kind of get familiar with the queuing that you want to say. So what is it that you want to say and how do you want to say it? If you're bringing someone into a crescent lunge, how are you gonna do it? What words would you like to use? Is there a thematic element to the class that you would like to add some extra language that might feel nice? Uh, these are questions that you should ask yourself and get really comfortable with, especially if you're cueing shapes that might be unfamiliar. If you're cueing an arm balance that you've only maybe cued one other time, it's important to take a moment to stop, script that out to know how you can effectively bring someone into that arm balance or, in, or something that you don't normally cue. If it's a different style of class, it's important to think about, okay, how am I gonna get them from point A to point F? <laughs> and all of those spaces in between are just as important as the actual poses themselves. What you say in those spaces in between are, is just as important as what you say while they're in the pose. So getting really comfortable with cueing a specific pose and then linking that together, particularly if you're teaching vinyasa yoga, how are you gonna get from Mary Chiasana one all the way back to downward facing dog? And that transition can be strained, moving from the floor, moving through the vinyasa sequence, moving back to downward facing dog and getting really comfortable in, in saying this is where I want you to go and this is how I'm gonna get you there. Next, once you're familiar with how you want to cue something and once you have an economy of language, so you you've developed these different techniques and tools and language tools that you can use in order to make uh, the shape, make your students comfortable in the shapes that, they're, that you're cueing, you then need to become aware of how you're actually cueing it. So usually what I want to say and what I do say can be quite different. Something that I highly recommend is cueing yourself through the shapes while recording it and then playing the recording back and listening to what you said. Sometimes this is the most illuminating experience. I do this um, with a mentorship with my teacher. And I don't usually listen to the recordings when I send them off for him to review because then I'm like, oh, I crumble and I'm like, oh my God, I'm the worst person ever. Why do I say this um, and get really dramatic and, you know, but I'm human and we all, you know, cue things in the way that we do. But playing it back to yourself can be really illuminating in the things that you say. And so the, there's three things that are the most commonly cued mistakes that I hear um, at my studio and in teacher trainings. It's over and over again. I hear these and these take away the, from the direct command form. Uh, and we're going to go over those things. So the first one, and this will depend on the style and the teacher's choice and how you uh, are choosing to set up the room and be the teacher and what your different studios culture uh, creates, but I, uh, at our studio, our teachers are not allowed to practice along with the students, um, and I don't teach teacher training that, that way as well. I think it's important to be able to uh, hold space and move around and see people's bodies uh, it, as you're cueing it and be able to adjust and give different alignment and depth cues based upon what you're seeing instead of practicing. Now, it, sometimes in an advanced practice, I might practice more um, and, and do that a little bit differently, but in, in a mixed levels class or in less, I usually wanna see what, what's happening. Um, and I feel like that I can most effectively do that if I am not practicing. But if I'm not practicing, what I say should reflect that. So one of the most common mistakes that I, I hear when I am, when people are learning to teach or within uh, different communities is the we are going to. You have no idea how many times people will say this and they might say it through the entire class even though they are not doing it. So for example, we are going to put our right foot forward. Well, the first question I have is like, are we? And I'll look up and I'm like, are you doing it? And they're not. So th that's 
immediately takes me out of my practice because if I'm queuing we are going to, I might want to look at the teacher because that is telling me, okay, they might be demoing or they might be mirroring or they might be showing me something that I need to see. Uh, and if that's not the case, that can be distracting. So simply eliminate, we are going to, don't even put you are going to, <laughs> just get rid of the whole phrase, change our to your, I don't know if you can see this, and simply say, put your right foot forward. And this is really, really pivotal because it's direct, it's command form, and people know what it means. Put your right foot forward, or put your right foot in between your hands, or put your right hand down and lift your right arm up, as opposed to we are going to put our right hand down and next we are going to lift our right arm up. All of those extra words will take up time in your class as well. This is the other thing, uh, the standard, uh, you know, the culture is moving more towards our classes. If you're teaching an hour class, you really want to make every single thing that you say impactful and count. And it's really important to think about that as you're moving into, um, you know, time management. If you add we are going to and then in all, into all of your, all of your queuing, uh, it, first of all, it takes, away the, it takes away a lot of the power of what you're trying to say. And, and secondly, it takes up time <laughs> and you don't want to take up that much time in a class particularly if it's an hour you want really want to move people's bodies efficiently and what you what you are queuing should be just as efficient the next thing is the ing the ing the ing the ing this immediately takes you out of direct command form pudding pudding putting your left foot forward, stepping your right foot back, reaching your right arm up, lifting your chest up. All of the INGs continues to take you away from direct command form. It also makes it less efficient. Again, it's taking up time. Um, if you add ING to every single verb that, that you're doing uh, or that you're saying, but also it, it just doesn't sound as impactful. And this is the thing, you really want your students to clearly hear what you're saying. And if you're cueing something complex, you know, it, putting your, especially an arm balance or, or an inversion, or if you're cueing a strong class, or if you're teaching vinyasa, or if you're holding a pose in, in a hatha class, you know, you really want your words to, to, to create that, that, same, that same feeling, that same rasa, that same essence, that same, that same energetic quality. And when you add ing to every verb, it takes that away. So if I'm in crescent lunge and I've been there for 30 seconds and you want me to hold it for 30 more seconds, <laughs> and you're saying, now lifting your chest up and sinking a little bit deeper and reaching your arms up and pushing your right leg forward, it sounds very different than lift your chest up reach up higher, push your leg to the side, squeeze your hips in. All of those are very direct and they're very impactful. They make me want to activate. They make me want to get in that pose a little bit deeper. And so that's the feeling that you want to create. So simply eliminating the ING. And again, put your right foot forward. Now, pause. You may think that you cue this way already. This is why I highly encourage you to record yourself as you're teaching or record one of your classes. Carry around a recorder for your own benefit and then play it back and start to listen to the words that you're actually saying. Even when I'm recording videos like this and I start to listen, I'm like, what the hell did I say? You know, like, oh my God. Uh, and it's important to be self-aware and often we think that we know what we're saying, but we're not exactly as in tune to it as we think. And this goes for experienced teachers. I've taught thousands and thousands of hours of yoga, and I still am illuminated with some of the things that I say in class. And I'm like, I can't believe I said that. I didn't, I had no idea. Uh, so I think it's really, really important. And again, giving yourself grace, uh, because we all do things like this. This isn't, this doesn't mean that you're less than a teacher. This means that you're a teacher that really respects their craft and is looking farther into how to develop and cultivate a sense of professionalism and impact, uh, imp be an impactful teacher. Going back to wording and verbiage. The other thing that I often, often hear 
is and then, this often is accompanied with and then we are going to, but the and then, put your foot forward, next, reach up. Now, you can see put your foot forward is in command form. Reach up, direct command form. When you add and then and next, it starts to take that away. It takes the impactful uh, verbiage away. It takes the, the, the action-oriented uh, words away. And often, if you're accompanying this with breath cueing, that can be even more distracting. So if you're saying, and then inhale, put your right foot up. Next, exhale, reach up. And, and, and this takes away the, the power of what you want them to do, which is both breathe and move. So simply eliminating and then and next and say, put your right foot forward, reach up. It saves time. It's impactful. You know exactly what you want to do. And you can add breath cueing quite easily. Inhale, put your right foot forward. Exhale, reach up. Now, I probably wouldn't cue the reaching up on an exhale, but I'm giving that to you as an example. Um, same thing here. Put your right foot forward. If you're saying inhale, putting your right foot forward, this, again, doesn't give you this kind of fluidity with breath and movement. So particularly if you're teaching vinyasa yoga, or if you're teaching a really breath-centered hatha class, you want to be just as specific and just as clear with what you would like people to do. These are just a few tips of the most common things that I see, the we are going to, the ing mistake, and the nexts and thens. <laughs> and you might even hear me in this video saying, and then. <laughs> and it, it, this is not an exclusion of this type of wording and cueing methodology. So something that I subscribe to is called sad cueing. This is how we teach our teachers to cue, and that's first you cue the shape, then you cue the alignment, and then if possible you cue depth cueing, and we'll go over that in another video. But when you're trying to incorporate all of those things into one pose, the more that you can cut out superfluous language, the more clear and direct you can be, the more, uh, the more space it's going to create for you to be able to add all kinds of things in. But let's say you're focusing on a theme and you want some time to actually speak about the theme. Well, taking out all of this language, I mean, imagine if every cue had this, this wording to it. it. You could say five minutes even, ten, depending on how often you're using it. And it opens up space for other things. It opens up space for you to really cue pace. It opens up for more poses. It opens up to really hit home a thematic element. But more, most importantly, I find that this type of cueing is extremely impactful and extremely direct, and people understand it. This is, most people are not verbal learners, and ver verbiage is in our cueing methodology, and what we say is the very, very first tool that we have as a yoga teacher. So thinking about that in the grand scheme of things, with, and you have 40 bodies in a room, and everyone's trying to figure out what you want them to do, the more specific, the more clear, and the more direct you can be, the easier it will be for your students to translate that into a somatic experience. And so I highly encourage you to, to be curious about what you say in class. Um, make it meaningful, make it impactful, make it specific, make it direct. Get comfortable with cueing in this way. Get comfortable with holding the seat of the teacher and having that authority to be really com commanding. Uh, that can be uncomfortable for a lot of people. And, and really, really give yourself grace as you start to get really curious about what you're saying. Um, it's important to really develop your language as a teacher. And the more you do this, the more you're able to develop a vocabulary of language that just comes to you. Uh, I encourage you to do scripting exercises, record yourself and listen back and see what you're saying. Uh, it can be quite illuminating and I continually evolve as a teacher as I do this myself. So thank you for joining me uh, on my YouTube channel. I hope to offer lots of teacher tips as we move forward every week and stay tuned. Deuces and Namas.